we're waking up. If, if this election holds, we're waking up to a new America. And we're going to talk about a little bit about that first. But turn with me to this morning, if you will, to you, in your Bibles, to the book of Daniel, chapter 1. The book of Daniel, chapter 1. I'll be again reading at verses 1. Father, again today I thank and praise you for the privilege of gathering together in this sanctuary to be able to lift our voices and our hearts in praise and worship to you. Now as we come to looking into your word, I'm asking for the next few minutes of time that you would grant unto me, your servant, the ability to speak the word that you put upon my heart. May the Holy Spirit go before me today. Prepare each and every one of our hearts that we would receive with understanding what the Spirit is saying to the church in this hour. I ask it in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Daniel chapter 1, I want to read the first eight verses. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. He brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure of his God. The king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youth in whom was no defect who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, who, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. To Daniel he assigned the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. I want to share with you this morning a little bit about Daniel. The setting of scripture, Daniel was just a young man just a young, actually he was about 19 years old at that time, in the royal court of King Jehoiakim. When Jeremiah was prophesying, God was warning Judea and Jerusalem of what God was going to do if they did not repent and turn back to God. Jeremiah the prophet was giving those warnings. He, Daniel was a young man who loved God with all of his heart. He loved God okay, and was full okay, of visions, his own visions for the future. He had his own dreams. He's had his own thoughts about what he wanted to do and what he wanted to be. Like most young men, okay, Daniel probably had his eyes on one of the Jewish young ladies, thinking about someday I want to marry her and have a family of my own. You see, he was no different. He was no different than, than we are today. People of his day were no different than we are. Okay. They had their hopes. They had their dreams. They had their plans, just like we do. Just like we do. Daniel had heard of the warnings about God's coming, about the judgment that he was going to, to bring to Jerusalem and Judah if they did not obey him. I say to you today, we here in the United States of America have heard the judgment pronounced that God is going to do if America doesn't repent. 
Call has gone out time and again for America, to, to, for the churches to get down before God and to pray and, and seek God for repentance, that America would repent before God. And I told you a few weeks back that what has to happen for America to repent as we pray and seek God, God has to move upon the heart of the president and he will have to call America. Remember, an indi we as individuals have to repent for ourselves, But our leader has to repent for America. He has to repent for America. Stand on the steps. My prayer is that God will call him to stand on the steps of the White House and call the press together so that everybody gets the message and then repent. Call America to fast and pray and repent before God for our sins. When that happens, we have to change. Those things that we know are abomination to God, we have to get rid of. Are you listening to me? It's quiet in here. We have to get rid of abortion. We have to get rid of homosexuality. We have to get rid of lesbianism. We have to get rid of all the sexual impurity and sins. We have to realize that God has a standard for the church and we have to adhere to that standard. If we pronounce and, and proclaim that we are Christians, then we must live like Christians. We must live what the word of God says. And if we don't, if we don't repent, if we don't turn, if this nation doesn't repent, judgment will come, just like God promised it. Okay. Knows. Daniel had heard the warnings as a teenager. He had heard the warnings. He knew all about them, but nobody knows when it is going to happen. He did not know when it was going to happen. He had plans for his life. He had dreams and hopes that he was making. He was living in royalty very wealthy family, but he also was serving, living under King Uzziah, who was a very godly king, a godly man. If you read about Daniel in chapter 6, it says, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. That's Daniel speaking. The Daniel we're talking about this morning. But one morning, Daniel awakes and finds himself being carried away to Babylon. His whole world has just changed, just as Jeremiah has said it would. He finds himself being carried away from, from his family, his loved one, his beloved Judah. He was carried away. Now, Daniel has some choices to make. He's been carried away. Remember, he loved God. He was raised and taught about God and how to, to live for God. Now he's being carried away. Think about it for a moment. 19 years old, away from mom and dad, away from the influence of godly people, carried into a, a land where the, the king is a very immoral, ungodly man, where the people are ungodly, immoral people. His whole surrounding, his whole life is changed. How is he going to handle it? He could have taken the attitude, well, in Rome do as the Romans do. That wasn't his attitude. Listen to him. Okay. He had the choices to make. Serve God or please the king. If he didn't do what the king commanded they do, he's facing death. If he doesn't obey the king, he's gone. The king would kill him. Okay. But I want you to listen with me again this morning to verse 8. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Daniel knew that all the food that they were given from the king had been offered up to idols before they ever brought it. He knew it was stuff that he was not, as, as a Jew, was not supposed to eat. And so he purposed, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to defile myself. I know what the consequences are. If, if I don't, I could be killed. But I'm going to serve my God. I'm going to serve my God. 
He made the choice. Okay. Folks, I want us to listen. Daniel knew that that judgment was coming, but he didn't know when. We know that Jesus is coming back for us. We know that. We believe that. That's the hope of the church. We know and we believe it. But we do not know when. We don't know when. Jesus tells to watch and be ready. He warns us to stay watching and ready. But it's been a long time. It's been over 2,000 years. And he still hasn't come back. And there's a problem going on with that. The church has slacked off. Loud things into the church that are against the word of God. God is sending a message to the church. Awake! Awake! Now is your salvation nearer than when you first believed. The Lord is about to come. Okay. Listen to what Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Whoa, wait a minute. Let me just pause here for a minute. The things that are happening in our nation today, the things that are happening, cause us, if we don't stay focused on Him, cause us to have trouble in our, have a troubled heart. Worry and fear, uncertainty. But Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Hear that. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I'm going to prepare a place for you. Folks, he wasn't just talking to the disciples at that time. He's talking to all of us, the whole church, all down through the ages. He's preparing a place for us. Okay. And he said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Praise God. Jesus is coming back. He's coming for us. And I say to you this morning, watch and be ready. I believe with all of my heart that the time is growing closer and closer. I shared my wife and I talking about it this week, talking about what's going on with the election and everything. And I told her, I said, honey, we don't know. This may be God's way of bringing judgment to, the, to America, but I'm praying and believing if that's the case, then the church will be raptured before it's poured out. Now, I don't know that for sure, but I know the church is going to be raptured. I don't know when, but I'm praying, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Okay. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's look at verses 13 through 18. Paul is speaking. He said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe, I want you to notice that little word there, if. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That means those that have died. Okay. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I want you to notice something there, the previous verse. It said the dead shall rise first. Okay, but let's look at this. 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, how? Together with them in the clouds. It doesn't mean that the, the dead are going to be raptured and then sometime later we'll be raptured with it. Oh, no. As soon as the dead are raptured, we're going to be caught up right behind them and be there with them. We're going to rise together to meet the Lord in the air. What a day, what a day that's going to be. So I say to you this morning, like Daniel, one day, one day, soon, the Lord is going to shout, the trumpet's going to sound, and we're going home. We're going home to be with Jesus. God is stirring, hear me this morning, God is stirring the hearts of many, many, letting us know that the time is near. He's speaking to his servants with the, this message. We have a choice to make. We have a choice to make. And that choice is this. Where will you spend eternity? Where will we spend eternity? Let me rewind this a little bit. Okay. Remember, I told you, it's been over 2,000 years. I was raised in an Assembly of God church from the time that, that I was born. I was raised in the church. From all the time that I can remember back, that I can remember and understand, I was taught Jesus is coming again. I was taught about the rapture of the church. I was taught of these things. I had a, a very godly grandmother. My grandmother was a strong woman of God. She was saved when she was young. She was saved in a Brush Arbor meeting. And she got saved. She believed the word of God. My grandmother would not take medicine of any kind. She wouldn't take any. She said, the Bible said God will heal me. She stood on that. And when grandma got sick, she wouldn't get, take medicine. She wouldn't go to the doctor. Family would beg her. She wouldn't go. She stood on her commitment. You know what? God healed her. God healed her. She believed. Many a time, Grandma lived with us for quite a while. Many a time, I passed by. She had a, bed, a, a room of her own, her own bedroom. Grandma had a creaking rocking chair. And she would sit in that rocking chair with her Bible and read her Bible or pray. And many's been the time when I've gone by that door and I've heard Grandma praying for us. There's nine of us. And Grandma would call us out, our names out one at a time, and pray for us. There have been some times when, uh, don't tell anybody else, I'm going to tell you this. There have been times when the pastor was a bad boy. Real bad. You know what my grandma would do? She'd grab me by the ear like this. She would lead me right into her bedroom. She would sit down in the rocking chair. She would set me on the floor beside it. Not just me, my other brothers too. Sisters didn't have because they didn't be bad. <clears throat> okay. But we'd, we'd sit there beside her. Sometimes grandma would read a scripture and tell us. But she would tell us what we did was wrong. And we had to sit there with her and listen to her. And then she would pray over us. I believe. Now my dad was a, was a strong believer and that my dad's attitude was, it's in the Bible. Mother says it's in the Bible. If mother says it's in the Bible, then it's in the Bible. And that's the way, that's the way my dad thought. Okay. But I believe that I'm here today as a minister of the gospel because of my grandmother's prayers. My grandmother's prayers. Okay. I say to you, remember, we, I couldn't get to heaven. I want to say that to you. I cannot go to heaven on grandma's coattails. No matter how well she taught me, no matter how much she prayed for me, I had to make a choice. I had to receive him as my Lord and Savior. I couldn't go on her coattail. None of us can go to heaven on the prayers of others. Yes, others pray for us. But we have to make the choice. Where are we going to spend eternity? One of two places. There's no other place. It's either heaven or hell. Where are we going to spend eternity? 
I want to remind you. God has done everything he can to, to give us salvation. To keep us from going to hell. He gave his only begotten son to die on the cross for each one of us. But we have to make that choice. Now, this week, I was sitting in the pew that Dave and Darla are sitting in. I come in early in the morning, take, bring my Bible with me. And I was sitting there reading my Bible. The election was going on and uh, didn't look good at all. But I want to I wanna say this to you before I go any further. Hold on. It isn't over yet. It isn't over yet. Okay. It's not over yet. Depends on how the court, the Supreme Court, rules over President Trump's com uh, complaints. He says he has evidence for everything he's going to show the court. Other people say they have evidence they're going to apply. So it's not over yet. I've been praying, and I, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I want President Trump to win. Okay, I can say that now, the election's over. I want President Trump to win. And so I have prayed and I've said, Lord, you know my heart. You know that I want President Trump to win. But I'm praying, Lord, let your will be done. That your will be done. Okay. Because the word says, my thoughts are not his thoughts. No, my way is his way. God knows what is best. He knows what he's planned and for the time and the future. And so we pray, need to pray God's will be done. If it's God's will that he be reelected, the court will rule in his favor. Those ballots that they say they uh, didn't find and can't count them now, they'll be counted if, if it's God's will. So just keep trusting, keep praying, but pray God's will be done. Okay? So I want to remind you folks, the elect, if the election stands as it is, if the election stands as it is, Trump doesn't win his case, then we, the church, okay, like Daniel, will wake up to a changed America. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If it goes the way they want it, we're going to wake up to a changed America. We're going to wake up to a crooked Democratic Party. Okay. Now, some of you not, might not like me saying that, but I can speak my feelings just like you can. Okay. The election's over, so I can speak whatever. They're crooked. They're corrupt. They have rigged this election. And if you can prove it, things are going to change. But if not, their agenda is to make America a socialist nation. What are they saying? We're going to give you free insurance. We're going to give you free this. Folks, we're not children. We're not children. We know that there's nothing free. There's nothing free. Somehow it's got to be paid for. Who's going to pay for it? Well, their thought is, we're going to take from the wealthy, we're going to take everything, and we will dole out what's needed. Socialist nation. I don't know about you, but we need to get some calluses on our knees that God will do something about this. Okay. Let's take a look at Mark's Gospel, chapter 4. As I said, I was sitting in the pew where Dave and Darla are sitting, and I was praying about this and praying about the election and asking God, Lord, what's going to happen to America? What's going to happen to America? And the Lord began to speak this to my heart. Mark's Gospel, I want to read from chapter 4, I want to read chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. At the same day, now Jesus has been teaching all day. There's a multitude of people around him. He's been preaching and teaching. He's been casting out demons. He's been healing the sick. And he's exhausted. He's literally exhausted. At the same day, when evening was come, he saith unto them, that is to the disciples, let us pass over unto the other side. Hold that there for just a moment. I ask you to look on the screen, see that portion of scripture. I want you to read the last portion with me, starting with let. 
Read it out loud with me. Let us pass over to the other side. Jesus spoke that to the disciples. Let's pass over to the other side. Folks, let me remind you. Jesus spoke a word to the church, to every believer. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will return that I can receive you that where I am, you may be also. He's preparing a place for us. He's going to take us home. Okay? He told the disciples, we're going to pass over okay, to the other side. Verse 37 now, please. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. Now, folks, when he told them, we're going to pass over to the other side, he did not tell them that that storm was going to come up. He did not tell them they were going to be in danger. He did not tell them that their lives could be at stake. He didn't tell them any of that. He just said, we're going over to the other side. He went to bed. He was tired. He was exhausted. Let's go on. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and saith unto him, Master, carest not that we perish? Listen, I wish that we could hear that disciple, the, the sound of his voice, the fear in his voice as he's crying out to Jesus, awaking him up. Master, don't you care that we are about to perish? Hear it? They were afraid. Now there's something happens if we're not careful. If we're not focused on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. There's something happens when we get in trouble, when the storms come, when the problems come, when the brokenness comes, when the heartaches come. If we're not focused on Jesus, something happens. What's that, Pastor? We see it in the disciples. Jesus said, we're going over the other side. But when the storm came up, when the, in fear of, of drowning, of the boat sinking and drowning, they forgot what Jesus said. They forgot what he said. Church, many times the church forgets what Jesus said. I'm coming for you. They do one of two things happens. They develop one of two attitudes. Either I've got plenty of time I can do whatever I want to do and I've got plenty of time and, and I can repent later down. Folks, we are not guaranteed of tomorrow. We're not guaranteed of the rest of this day. When I woke up this morning, and I do this many times, when I wake up, I ask the Lord to forgive me for any sin that I've committed. I ask Him to deliver me from the evil one today. Keep me from presumptuous sin. I don't know. And then I tell him, Lord, I don't know what this day is going to bring forth. I don't know who I'm going to talk with today or what conversation I'm going to have. But you know it all. So I'm asking you for today that you give me the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding that I need for today. Okay. Every one of us need to pray that. We don't have it in ourselves, folks. We might think so. And I know that there's some people that think they're the smartest thing that ever happened. But we don't know what's going to happen. So we need to seek God for guidance. Okay. The disciples were, were afraid. They were scared to death. They forgot what Jesus said. Like I said, many times when, when troubles and brokenness all comes, many people forget in the midst of their hurt in the midst of the trouble, in the midst of the fear that's gripping their heart, they forget what Jesus has said. They forget. They said, I'm coming back for you. He didn't tell us what's going to happen in between. There's a lot of struggles. There's a lot. Of, every one of us here this morning, I don't want you to do this, but if I ask you, everyone that has gone through trying times, everyone that's gone through brokenhearted experiences, everyone that's gone through deep, dark trouble, raise your hand. I believe that every one of us could raise our hands. The Lord didn't tell us we would go through that. But he did prepare our hearts for it. The peace of God that surpasses all of our understanding will guard our heart and guard our mind. 
Philippians 4, 7. He'll take care of it. Okay. The disciples forgot it. They forgot what he said. The Bible says, He arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? I have to be honest to you. There been times when things happened in my life that that fear gripped my heart. I got to looking at the circumstances. And the deeper it got, the stronger the fear. And I forgot what the Lord told me. I forgot what he said. Number one, he's promised he's coming back for us. But he also promised this. But my God shall meet all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What is he saying? He's going to take care of us. He's going to take care of us. So in those times, we need to get a hold of ourselves. Take a little time and read Ephesians chapter 6. We need to get a hold of ourselves and say, Lord, and Ruth and I said this together just yesterday, going over all things. Lord, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, okay, remember, your thoughts are not his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. Lord, no matter what happens. He didn't say... He didn't say, it's going to happen, live with it. No, he didn't say that. He told us, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. What is he asking us to do? Right now in the situation we are in here in the United States, Right now, what we are facing, the uncertainty of it right now, what's he asking us to do? Trust him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your understanding. What does that mean? Don't try to figure it out. God already knows what he's going to do. Do you remember when God, uh, Jesus took the five loaves and the two fishes? Before he did, he asked Philip, what are we going to do? What do you have? That same verse says, Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Folks, right now, God already knows what he's going to do. He already knows what this day is going to bring and what tomorrow is going to bring. He knows how the election is going to turn out. What we need to know and understand and get into our heart is God's in control. Man may think he is, but God's in control. So, Pastor, how do you know that? Well, first of all, Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and all they who dwell therein. It belongs to God. God's in control of it. Okay? It's his. And God will do what he's promised to do. So he says, just trust me. Don't try to figure it out. Just trust me. So that's, we need to get a hold of that. Okay. If this election goes the way they're saying it is right now, if he's again declared our president, America's going to change drastically. Okay. But I was talking to the Lord about it sitting there. And the Lord gave me Mark chapter 4, what I've just shared with you. Jesus said to the disciples, get in the boat. I thought, Lord, what does that have to do with now? I mean, he strongly encouraged me to read it. And I read it. And I could feel it. I said, Lord, what does that have to do now? Folks, hear me carefully. We are in God's boat. 
we are in his boat. And he said, I'm going to take you over. He's going to come and take us home. What is he saying to us? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. If I was, speech, me, if I was speaking to a Spanish-speaking congregation, I would say, Jesus said, no te apuras por nada. Okay. That means don't worry about anything. He's in control of it. He's in control. So God is saying to us, I'm here. I'm with you. I'm going to take care of you. No matter what it is, we can trust God. He says, <clears throat> excuse me, I told you, each one of us have to make a choice. The Lord told me sitting there, I'm in his boat. I'm in his boat. Now I'm going to ask a question. I want to ask a question. And this time I'm going to ask you, raise your hand when I ask the question. You see, we're, we're not supposed to be ashamed of him. Jesus spoke this to me. I'm in his boat. That he's going to take me to the other side. My question for you this morning. Are you, each one of us here, are we in his boat? Are you in his boat? If you're in his boat, raise your hand with me. Praise God. Praise God. Let's give him a praise. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That means uh, we're in his boat. What does it mean? We don't worry about tomorrow. Was that scriptural? Well, let me think about that a minute. Oh, guess what? I hear Jesus say this. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of the things of itself. Yeah, it's in the Bible. So let's don't worry about it. Let's trust him. Let's trust him. Okay. Say, so, but pastor, what about all the changes? He's in control, folks. Okay. He's going to take care of us. He's going to take care of us. You know, we've had a good president. President Trump has been a good president. He's not been ashamed to say that he's a believer. He's not been ashamed to talk about Jesus. He's not been ashamed, and I heard it myself as in an interview he had. People were telling him, what a great man. He said, no, 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 it's Jesus. He said, it's Jesus. Okay. Look what he's done for Israel. What all the other presidents promised to do and never did, he did it. Look what he's done for the Christians. Okay. He stands up, folks. But we don't know about tomorrow. We do know this. If this president is elected, he's not a man of God. Okay. He's not a man of God. He wants to do things that are not for the Christian believer. Keep praying. Enough said about that. We're going to pray. Okay. Father, this morning, we raised our hands, acknowledging that we are believers, that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We believe that we are in that boat. We are going to heaven. We are going to spend all eternity with you. I thank you for every hand that was raised. I thank you, Lord, that we can take the time to praise and to worship you, to give glory and honor to you. We thank you. We thank you for the assurance of the hope that is within us. But Father, as we sit here, there may be some listening in to this service today that have not made that choice, that are not sure where they're going to spend eternity. Lord, there are those that know I haven't made the choice, and if I don't make the choice, I'm going to hell. Lord, I ask you to speak to those hearts today. And if you're here in that place, if you're hearing the sound of my voice today, you've heard the message and you, you feel that I need to make that choice today, I'm going to ask you to just pray this simple prayer with me. Pray it and mean it. I can't pray it for you. As I pray it, I'm asking you to repeat it. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I have sinned against you. Today I ask you, to forgive me for all of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart. 
I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, that I can spend all eternity with you in heaven. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you meant it, you believe it, welcome to the family of God. Family of God. Stand with me this morning, if you will. Thank you, Jesus.